Farming Dakota citizen Bobby Wilson is always keeping himself busy. He spoke to ICT about the upcoming and final season of FX's Reservation Dogs and shares a couple of stories. Dakota citizen Bobby Wilson is a storyteller. For the hit TV show Reservation Dogs, the poet nicknamed Bobby Dews pulled from the pain and joy of his youth in St. Paul and Minneapolis, Minnesota. I mean, I grew up in the east side when I was a teenager. A lot of time, my, the, the boy's home that I was sentenced to that I wrote about for Res Dogs was in the east side. So I spent two years in a county, in a Ramsey County boy's home right next to the police station. That's so stupid. And uh, she's the only one who's like, house we haven't been to. You know, everybody else, even Willie Jack, you know, we got a whole episode with her and her dad. So it's like, um, I, I pitched, I was, I was pretty nervous to pitch it because I didn't want it to be like a sad, you know, like sad story or, you know, sad cheese storyline. And, uh, uh, you know, I was so happy and, you know, eternally grateful to Sterling when I pitched like cheese in the boys home. It's like, what if he don't have his parents? Like, what if we don't really even know where they are at? Because that happens to a bunch of native kids. It happened to me. I didn't know where the hell my parents were for like most yeah. of my teen years. Bobby talked about the show's impact and how every part of the production centered the ways Native people work together. It, it, it ain't my show, and it is everybody who watched its show. It's like what you're saying, I, you know, that's, that's the goal. And there's like 10 of us on, on a little council who get to do like philosophize back and forth for a few weeks to come up with those stories and to tell each other's stories and say, I knew like 20 kids like that, you know, growing up or something, you know, it's like everybody had that experience, even if they were on sort of the fringe of it, everybody knew some kids who were going through that. And, and, and like, like everything that the kids go through in the episode. Um, yeah. So we try our best to represent. And I was so freaking touched, man. I got like a bunch of messages afterwards from people who had gone who had grown up in like the institutionalized systems you know for one reason or the other ended up you know that having to ask some housing authority to go on pass you know to do whatever i don't know go see your friends after school or something it, it was such a a success in its first season uh critics and audiences loved it on its second season and for a third season to come through, I mean, really, it's it's 100% a creative choice. And, you know, I'm not trying to talk. I don't want to talk out of turn on it because it's not my decision. The The showrunner, our, our, uh, the guy who led the whole thing, Sterling, it's his, you know, primarily his creative choice. Uh, and it makes sense. You know, he, t he called everybody, he talked to us all about it. And, you know, uh, I'm not going to spoil anything about the season, but, you know, it's like... Uh, to just keep on going with n like the same, I guess, story world, uh, living in that space. It's, uh, it, we don't want to lose the magic and the beauty of that and to like let it play out the way that it naturally was. Cause that's really mostly what we do in the writer's room is like, we're drawing logical conclusions to stories, you know, or like we're, we're, we're moving this thing along in its, uh, in all its different lines and all the different arcs. And, and you know, we don't want to keep rebooting, like, you know, season four cheese becomes, you know, uh, I don't know. Wilson, who was also an incredible muralist talked about the flow and the magic they made behind the scenes of reservation dogs. <laughs> it's a big decision. I mean, yeah, there's so much love between everyone who makes it and it's such a personal thing and i've seen like <laughs> like years long beefs mended on the set of that show you know and like there's there's a magic to it and um you know it, it's like one all of us wrote that it becomes so personal and there's so much that we share with each other in the in the uh planning of that story and then even in the creation of it everyone else that comes in our our line producer or all of our different directors that come in and and lend their lives and expertise and magic to the set and to the story to our first ad our uh who, who, who are arena directors that keep going and like 
the magical uh, 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 DP who just, you know, all eyes on everything. It's really beautiful. Uh, and you don't want to, you want to keep going with that forever. It's really like, could heaven ever be like this? You know, like, <laughs> and, it, and it will again, you know, like, that's really, I think the wonderful thing is like, you know, nobody wanted this show to like uh, devolve into something corny that like, you know, is just for the money or for the sake of making it like, we got to keep making more stuff. And we are like everybody in our, in our crew, everybody on our team is doing so much. And I'm like, I'm just super pumped to see where it goes from here. And finally, Bobby Wilson, Sasit the one while paid to one citizen and my new at the relative gave some advice for Indian country. As we all begin the final season of another amazing indigenous show. Quit crying around. It's gonna be fine. You see this hat? There's ideas in that hat. And these hands, these are hands of action. This is amazing, but I don't know if my dad is that into pickles. What kind of native rapper ain't into pickles? You don't have anything more like a hardcore rapper would wear? Like a spicy pickle? In Bismarck, North Dakota, Vincent Moniz, ICT News. Indigenous movie stars were front and center at the Cannes Film Festival in May to promote the upcoming film Killers of the Flower Moon. Some of them used the moment to highlight Indigenous fashion. Joining us now virtually is Patricia Michaels. She has been producing one-of-a-kind couture for the last 20 years. Hello to you, Patricia. Hello, thank you for having me. It's a huge honor to be here. My native name is Wadanuli, and I'm from Taos Pueblo. My Pueblo relative, we're very happy that you're here today. Actress Tantu Cardinal wore a gown that you created called Tantu in Flight. That was in France at the Cannes Film Festival, as I just mentioned. Tell us about the gown and what it features. So when um, Jolie Proudfit had contacted me to see if I might be interested in creating the gown for Tantu, of course, I had already been creating that gown in my head and um, through another client. And I, and she's Osage, her name is Julie O'Keefe. And so I did this beautiful illustration after um, uh, Tantu and Julie contacted me. And I sent it to Tantu on a Zoom meeting and she said, Oh my God, I'd be so honored. This is so beautiful. So then we got started. But in the thought of creating something for such an important and a person that I admire with my whole heart and soul, she's the most um, prolific and celebrated Native American actor, actress that we have. And her years and decades of hard work, I wanted to celebrate in representation of an eagle because she, I think she had earned that kind of type of um, symbolism of something that is regal and, and that we will honor for her taking us into this beautiful years and highlighting the truth who we are as Native American. And I made a gown so that it would take her long journey that she's been, you know, doing her work in flight the way she is. And then also I wanted the feathers to brush away her trail so that she's always going into new direction. And so she's always going forward because she's always has been going forward in an industry that has not been very kind or easy for any Native American. And so I do a lot of, I mean, my eagle feathers are a lot of signature eagle feathers throughout the years on, on silk because I feel that silk carries the, the beauty and the, the likeness of the feather where it has endurance, it has strength, and it's graceful. I love to use it for women because the, the grace that Native women have and Native women are so strong that we, um, the, the type of work that we do in our Native country is immense and we're pretty tough people that I wanted to, I wanted to honor her with this. I wanted to, 
to acknowledge that there, here's a woman that is going to walk the red carpet, not only for herself, but for the greatness that she's, she's given to Native country. And so I, I put a team together of 11 people. So there was 12 of us in all, all from Taos and, and uh, the town of Taos, Taos Pueblo, and a, a woman from Santa Fe. And we just got to town, we just got to work. Actually, there was 13 of us. And we we just, I, I delegated different jobs for everybody. And in two weeks it was made. And I finished doing all the hand stitching of all the eagle feathers in um, her beautiful room in, in Cannes. And that was three days of no sleep, just eating nuts and drinking water, whatever juice was brought in. And um, there was about 20,000 hand stitches that were finished. And she couldn't have been more graceful and honorable to this whole process. I think more than anything, I received such knowledge and privileged to have come close with her and experience her stories, her strengths, and everything that I had put into the garments, which has come over the years, really showed in the beautiful woman that she is inside. To honor our people is how we are raised. You know, when somebody is called upon to be the person who's gonna carry the ceremony, somehow we traditionally get their garments done, the ceremonial outfits done, and before you know it, the ceremony's happy. And that's how I felt when I was asked to do this garment. Well, fashion designer and entrepreneur, Patricia Michaels, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Native American country.